Okay, great to see so many of you, and yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. Like I said, it's really great to see the, the interest in this. Um, I'm going to try and um, pass two sort of topics of information over to, to you tonight. I, I'm trying to convince you of a couple of themes, really. One is that um, we understand pretty well from a chemical and physical point of view what's happening with ocean acidification within the general scheme of things. But when you throw biology into the mix, then it gets really complicated and it's really hard to predict what's going to happen to the biology. And then the other thing that I want to try and get across is that when you start altering the biology, for instance, like ocean acidification might do, then um, you, you have the potential to actually generate feedbacks on climate, on the global environment. Because biology plays a really big role in that. And I, I, I just, um, I'd like to show you something. So this is, people have called it the breathing earth. And um, what you're looking at here is real data. It's collected by a satellite going round and round. And it, it's what people have been able to retrieve from this information is chlorophyll concentrations. So that's the pigment that captures light, that allows plants to grow, and generate biomass. And you can see here just how, how dynamic that is. So that's chlorophyll changing seasonally in the ocean and on, on the land. And it, it's really, what, why I'm showing it to you really is because in some ways I'm an old hippie. And um, <laughs> how many of you have heard of Gaia? Yeah, so there's a bunch of old hippies in this room. <laughs> but actually Gaia, you know, Gaia isn't really just, um, it's, not a, it's not a fad. It, it was generated by a guy called James Lovelock, a British scientist, and Lynn Margulis, an uh, American microbiologist, together. And it was, they were fantastic scientists in their own right. And James Lovelock just invented some fantastic chemical detection systems and really introduced us to the, the biogeochemistry and what we call these days earth system science really. And, um, but Gaia was about really how the biosphere, so that thin sort of rim of biological matter can control the environment that it, that it exists in. And he, it's pretty trendy to sort of knock Gaia these days amongst scientists. And, um, but people are really into sort of co-evolution, they call it nowadays, rather than Gaia. But, but yeah, it's, it's really about how, how the biology can control its, its, the environment that it exists in. And um, that, that was something that attracted my attention about, I don't know, 25 years ago. And I was kind of trying to think of what to do in my life. And I thought I, I, I'd, I'd try and follow that area, area of research. And there's a couple of us, Paddy Matry did, some, Paddy Matry did something pretty similar. We, we kind of got sucked into that Gaia story and we started looking at some of the, yeah. But so, so really when we talk about biology changing the climate, we're, we're talking about microbiology. For instance, this is a picture of the, an area of the North Atlantic, and you can see those sort of swirls and things. Those are phytoplankton blooms, and each one of those eddies, little eddies there, are about 10 kilometers across. So it's really big scale, and it takes that sort of scale to actually start affecting the, the climate that we live in. And I'm not going to bore you all with sort of the processes of acidification. I think you've come across it but lots of times probably, but it's really just about carbon dioxide dissolving into the sea. Forms carbonic, and carbonic acid when it gets there. And that, that dissociates, so sort of splits apart. And some of the carbonic acid ends up as hydrogen ions, and that's really what acidity is, the, the amount of hydrogen ions in, in solution. 
So as we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's the red and the black lines, then you also generate an increase in carbon dioxide in, in the seawater. And that does what we call lowers the ocean pH. And that's just a, a way of saying that it's increasing the acidity. pH is a really strange thing that I think ocean acidification has suffered with a great deal in trying to explain what's actually happening. Um, but people have, you know, these measurements have been done for a couple of decades now. There's been lots and lots of measurements in the ocean of carbon dioxide. We know how carbon dioxide transfers pretty well between the atmosphere and the ocean. It, it's pretty well constrained, I think. So actually predicting, I mean, you could go home now, predicting it for 100 years, it's just, it's going to happen, you know, and we know how much. I don't know what, what's interesting is to put it in context to say temperature change. So the, the top, top um, figure there shows the sort of aver the average pH or average acidity in the global ocean and the bottom one temperature. And you can see those red arrows try and show the scale of change in the acidity and the temperature that's going to happen over, say, the next 100 years or so. And actually, as you can see, the, the change in acidity is really huge compared with what's out there in the open ocean anyway, in that sort of, which is very different in the Dam Rascotta, where it's changing very fast, changing by three units of pH every day, every tide sort of thing. Very, very dynamic, the coasts are, in terms of acidity. But in the big open ocean, then it's much more stable. But the, big, the change is relatively really big in terms of acidity compared with, for instance, temperature. And here's just a, I just get this over and done with really, but <laughs> <laughs> you can see pH is a funny, funny thing to deal with. But what, it, what it's really a measure of is hydrogen ion concentration, H plus, and that's the acidity really. So the change in acidity is actually dramatic. It's not just 8.3 to 7.8 pH units. It's a tripling in, the, in hydrogen ion concentration that's going to probably happen in the next 100 years. So it's a threefold increase in acidity. So I talked about Gaia, and I talked about the connection between the biology and the climate, the atmosphere, really. And um, I was just going to show you a couple of animations that I think really demonstrate that. I've just come across recently, but this is, again, this is an image, a compilation of satellite-derived chlorophyll concentrations in the ocean. And it's just running through from two, 2005 through to almost present day, May 2015. But what you can see is just how dynamic it is. It's changing with the seasons, moving you know, that band of chlorophyll in the, in the tropics is moving north and south as the earth sort of tilts and it's more sunshine applied to the northern and southern hemispheres. Southern ocean is really dynamic. The big blooms, phytoplankton blooms occurring there in the summer. Same in the North Atlantic. I think. I'll sh show you something similar. So this is running on exactly the same time scales. But this is the proportion of cloud cover over the globe. So one means 100% overcast. And you can see that actually it's really similar to that chlorophyll concentration dynamic. And, at, and there's a link. There's a direct, there's a real causation there. So the biology is affecting cloud cover. It's not, it's not entirely the biology. But you can see just from the dynamics that those two things are changing seasonally, even less than seasonally, being affected, the biology is affecting the cloud cover. And I'll, I'll, I'll come on to why, why that's happening. But it, it's all part of this sort of feedback on the climate once you change the biology. So, so what happens, what, what's going to happen to the biology as it, as it becomes more acidic? Well, there's a, 
a, there's quite a few sort of physiological processes that are going to be affected. And, and one of the things that happens when the ocean becomes more acidic is that carbonate ions become less available. So a lot of the organisms in the ocean build carbonate skeletons of one kind or another, including the corals. And as it gets more acidic, that's going to be harder to do. And in fact, in some places where it's getting really acidic, then the carbonate skeletons that they've built are starting to dissolve again. And that's not only corals, that affects lots of creatures. For instance, cuttlefish larvae, when they start to try and lay down those, those shells that you feed to your canaries. The one on the right is a pteropod, so people call them sea butterflies, a really delicate animal that floats around in the plankton, swims around in them. And they form these really delicate calcium carbonate shells, you can see it's almost translucent and they're actually very susceptible and already being affected in the southern ocean by the increase in acidity. So there's evidence from southern ocean pteropods that they're struggling to lay down their shells as effectively as they were. And then even phytoplankton, so this is a tiny microscopic microalgal cell and it, it's these sort of round structures with all the striations on their calcium carbonate liths, they're called, and you can see a couple of loose ones on the top of the cell, you know, behind it there. But they're covered in liths, and actually these guys lay down more calcium carbonate than, any, than the reefs and all the rest of them put together. I mean, they, these guys do the business. They build the, the white cliffs of Dover are made out of these guys. And then one of the really interesting things that ocean acidification has been found to do is affect behavior in fish, for instance. So these clownfish, when they put in more acidic water, become less wary, so they're more easily predated upon. It's really why no one really knows, but it's, it's a, it's, it happens. And then there's, there's always going to be winners and losers in this sort of story, and that's, um, that's true for diatoms. So these are, again, microscopic algae floating around in the ocean, and they take up carbon dioxide to the photosynthesize. So as, more, as there's more carbon dioxide dissolving in the ocean, you'd think that they'd be able to photosynthesize faster, maybe, if carbon dioxide's the limiting thing. And in some, there is some evidence that in, for instance, the Southern Ocean, some of these diatoms, they're called, can grow faster than they could before. And again, similar sort of creature, another different type of phytoplankton, but these guys have, they, when you want to sort of grow fixed carbon, make biomass, you've got to capture the carbon somehow. And these guys have a pretty antiquated way of capturing carbon from, from the water carbon dioxide, and it looks like if you increase the carbon dioxide concentrations in the, in the seawater, then they'll be able to capture it more effectively and grow faster. So they, they might be winners in this story. And of course the oceans, you know, these are phytoplankton floating around, lots of different sizes, and it, it looks like bigger phytoplankton are going to benefit more from the increased acidity and increased carbon dioxide levels than smaller phytoplankton. So that's actually potentially going to have a really big effect because it's going to affect the size distribution and who can graze, who can eat which cells in the ocean and the whole, whole composition of the phytoplankton could change as bigger cells become more competitive. How are we doing? Any questions? So I was going to spend a little bit of time just talking about how some of the sort of um, difficulties in um, experimentally determining what's going to happen to the biology when they're faced with ocean acidification. And when ocean acidification first came up as this sort of um, big environmental stress, really, that might, might happen, and people had to you know, think, 
how, how are we going to test what, what the biology is going to respond or how the biology is going to respond. And started off and, you know, fairly naively just took an organism and off the shore, for instance, and put it in varying amounts of acidic, you know, different pots of water with varying amounts of acidity and just measured lots of different parameters and saw how it coped, you know. So some of them did okay, some of them didn't. But what can you derive from that? It's, it, it's not that simple. And I was, one of the reasons is that, for instance, oysters, you take these, these are actually, I'm ashamed to say these are Pacific oysters, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you take these guys and um, put them in pretty acidic water, these adult oysters, and they're, they're pretty tough. They can cope with it, certainly as, until the scientist gets bored anyway with measuring things. But um, you take the, the larvae, and that's a whole different story. So they produce, you know, you have to take into account the life history. And these guys produce larvae that end up in the plankton, and then they've got to settle back down on a rock somewhere and start trying to lay down one of these calcium carbonate shells. And that, that's really, that's turned out to be pretty critical for the guys who are trying to grow oysters on the west coast of the states. So on, on that sort of California, Oregon coast, it, it's, um, it's a really good sort of experimental model for ocean acidification because northerly winds come down that coast and they drive surface water off, offshore and that sucks deep water up from the bottom and that, that water's rich in carbon dioxide and it's acidic. So when it's, cold and it comes up near the coast and that's what these the hatchery guys the oyster hatchery guys have been trying to grow their oysters in and suddenly you know sort of a decade ago they started having real trouble because that's that deep water's got more and more acidic and that's um that had a really big effect on the oyster aquaculture and fishery on the west coast there and it wasn't until some of the scientists from Oregon State and Scripps gave these guys some decent equipment, decent analytical tools, and put them in the hatcheries, they realized it was the, ocean, it was the oceans getting more acidic, and that was causing the, the juvenile oysters not to be able to grow. So actually, some of these guys are even going to Hawaii now and setting up hatcheries or pumping carbon dioxide through their, you know, extracting carbon dioxide and taking surface water, doing all sorts of things to try and prevent this acidification effect on the juvenile oysters. How are they extracting the carbon dioxide? Yeah, that's... Oh, because... Sorry. <laughs> 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 Do you question, yeah, how are they extracting the carbon dioxide? Well, one way to do it is to bubble air through, through the water at a lower... that has a lower or no carbon dioxide in it, for instance. And then you'll, you'll take out, it'll come to equilibrium, for instance. That's one way of doing it. So another thing, when you just take one, one sort of, or go down to the shore, pick out some oysters or some sea urchins and take them back to your lab and try and do experiments, you haven't really taken a great sort of, a very wide sample of your population, so you haven't really sampled the genetic capacity in that population as a whole. You've just taken a couple of animals. It's really difficult to capture the whole potential capacity to adapt or, or at least acclimate to ocean acidification. And that, that's something that was shown in a really neat study by Lady Gretchen Hoffman and her group over on the West Coast as well. And they noticed that in, in that acidic water that's coming up to the surface, some, sometimes when it was really acidic, the juvenile sea urchins got small, you know, they're floating around in the plankton. They're pretty crazy looking things. I should have put a picture up of them. But um, they, um, they got smaller and smaller and less and less viable. And um, that was because things were getting acidic and it was harder for them to lay down these shells that they needed to build their skeletons. But uh, in amongst those sort of small, weak um, juveniles, she, they, the group often saw a few bigger, bigger individuals. 
And it turned out that these bigger individuals were actually coming, coming from, from up north, north of where most of the sort of upwelling is occurring and the waters are more acidic. And it turns out that those, those sea urchins, so up in northern California, are more robust or, to acidification than the southern population, southern members of the population. And they did some really neat studies. They took some from the north and they bred them with the individuals from the south. And then they found that actually the juveniles were again much, you know, somewhere in between, but more resistant to the acidification. And that just shows you, you know, that within that sort of big latitudinal range, there's some real capacity within the population, so genetic capacity to deal with some big environmental changes. And that, that's something really difficult to take into account sort of experimentally and predictively. You know. And then as, um, so we, you know, that, that sort of acclimatory changes. And the other thing is evolution. How, how quickly are things going to evolve? You know, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is changing really fast and um, much faster than it probably has ever done before, but it's still a few hundred years, and microbes, how quickly can they evolve? Can they, can they cope with it by you evolving? And um, it, it's, that's quite a hard thing to get, up, get a handle on as well, how, how fast do things evolve? But it's surprisingly quick, and it, it's even surprisingly quick in, um, in humans. And these guys, I grew up near this, where this photo was taken. These guys are Maasai from Kenya or northern Tanzania. And um, apart from having sort of genetic adaptations to jump really high, they have another pretty strange um, adaptation which we have as well, and that's this lactose tolerance. So, or lactase persistence. So most, most mammals feed on milk as, as youngsters, lose the ability to digest milk. Once they're weaned, no point in being able to digest milk. They just lose, lose the capability to do that. But some of the pastoralists, like Northern Europeans, some of the Africans, a few, few groups of people in, in, Asia, in Asia, um, they have a gene that just keeps producing the, the enzyme that allows you to digest milk throughout your life. And that's something that's only evolved since people started keeping dairy cows. So actually for, for us, it's probably about 10,000 years. For the Maasai, it's probably, these guys, it's probably about three and a half thousand years. And when you break that down to generations, that's only you know, a few hundred generations. It's not very long to be, for something like that to evolves you know, really so it's actually really easy to keep microbes in for 200 generations they some of them divide seven times a day something like that <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take long but um so there's, there's been some really great great studies on on how, how fast things mutate and particularly how fast microbes mutate and one of the really, so in order to evolve, you've got, you've got to mutate, really, especially if you're a microbe. And um, one of the early, earliest studies was by, by a guy called William, William Dallinger. And this was in Darwin's time he did these experiments. So he was a, a minister, but he's also a great scientist. And um, he kept, you can't really see it very clearly, but those sort of, little round things are animals, so microbial animals. And um, what he did, he, he kept them, he took them out of the environment and kept them in this sort of incubator thing on the right there. And they, they were growing at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And they were pretty happy there. And if you raise the temperature to about 72, they, they could just about cope. But if you took it much higher, they all died. So over, over actually a seven year period, he just gradually increased the temperature that they were living at. And sure enough, they started evolving to catch up with that. And he got them up to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so, but what was interesting was they couldn't come back down. They, they couldn't grow at 60 anymore. 
So he, he wrote to Darwin and said, hey, mate, you're right. <laughs> Things do. This isn't it. And uh, yeah, Darwin said, sent back something like, truly remarkable. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another, there's a really good study going on in the States, actually. It's, um, you've heard of E. coli, the bacteria. So there's a guy called Richard Lenski and his group, and they've been growing, keeping bacteria. And, and he started off with just one bacterial cell and grew it up, and then, so one E. coli, and then divide, took 12 of those progeny, and then they've kept dividing, and he's kept them separate. And he's, he and his group, they sub them on every day, so they add new sort of feed to them, and keep them growing every day it's taken and they've been doing that for 15 years and now they've got to 50,000 generations or something and they're all there's 12 different populations and he can test them against each other so he can add a food and see which ones do better and which ones have mutated or evolved to do better at certain conditions it's a fantastic study and it's really it's providing information on how you know how fast things how fast these microbes, for instance, out in the ocean, can evolve to things like ocean acidification. And it's pretty quick. So there's, there's plenty of hope from that point of view. But you can take organisms and you can um, just, you know, keep them in isolation in the lab. But it doesn't really tell you, well, there's something missing, and that's the biological interactions and the diversity that's involved. So you can evolve in a, you know, and mutate in a laboratory, but it's very different when something is trying to eat you or stab you or, you know. And there's an incredible amount of diversity out there as well, you know. And the more we look into the diversity in, in the ocean, especially in the microbiology, and the, you know, the more there is, the harder you look, the more you find, really. And um, so there's always going to be someone there who's going to step up to the plate and take over if you have your fitness levels sort of start to drop or something like that. Okay, so I was going to go on to um, talk about what, what we've been doing, really. But Any questions on any of that? Sure. Yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat that. Um, so uh, around where you're living locally, then there's quite a few species that seem to have disappeared recently. Sand dollars, sea urchins, uh, starfish. starfish um, and is that due to ocean acidification? Well, it, it probably isn't because um, they'll... Yeah, ocean acidification is is happening in the Gulf of Maine, but there's lots of other environmental pressures that are happening probably faster and to a greater extent just at the moment. But also there's, you know, there's, you've got to throw in biology and humans, I think. And there's certain predators moving into the area that have wiped out some of these <coughs> populations and there's plenty of fishing going on. So I, I, I don't think that sort of change could probably be it attributed to ocean acidification. But I think there's, there's lots of other environmental pressures or stresses that are involved. And, I, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But. What about the effect on the lobster population? Are they also getting shells from calcium carbonate? Yeah, they're getting shells from the lobster population. Yeah, so what's going to happen to the lobster population? Yeah, so what's going to happen to the lobster population? And that, that's a really, really good question. And actually, there's someone, there's a young lady, I don't think Jez is here, but um, at, at the lab, who's just starting to, starting to look at that very topic. And, and it's interesting, it's, it's understudied and we don't really know. But it looks like, again, the juvenile stages is prob are probably the vulnerable ones. Yeah. Okay, sure. How does acidity and um, how you're temperature affect the sexes? Hmm. 
Is it more damaging to females or males? And mm. Or the same? <laughs> It's high temperature and acidity, more damaging to females and males. Yeah, I don't know. No. <laughs> it's a good, and it, it probably, you know, there probably are organisms out there that are differentially affected for some reason, but I, I, yeah, I can't really think, think why. Um, I, I think, you know, some of these creatures broadcast their eggs and sperm into, into the water and it might be that it's at that level that it would have most effect. You know? I don't know. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I wonder what you think of the article that appeared in a couple of years ago in, in the New Yorker by Elizabeth Colbert, in which uh, she talked about uh, this question of the acidification of the ocean and the fact that the ocean is absorbing about 50% of the uh, uh, excess CO2 atmosphere that we've been pumping in. And her forecast uh, was truly frightening. Uh, her, uh, her expectation with respect to the uh, biology was that uh, uh, all shellfish would, would, would cease to exist, starting with the, 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 the um, microatomic, uh, or the, 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 the little tiny things that you described earlier. I wonder what you think of, of her conclusion. So, yeah, that's a long one to repeat, but... <laughs> so, in some ways, what, you know, that's a sort of doom and gloom prediction, isn't it? And, and what, what do I think, think about that um, that was published in the New York Times a couple of years ago? In the New Yorker magazine. New, New Yorker magazine, sorry. Um, well, I, I actually think there's, there's always, there's going to be winners and losers. You know? So, and something that... Ha happens more easily on the, on the, in the ocean than on <coughs> land, for instance, is that things can move. You know. So, for instance, quite a few organisms are moving in response to changing temperature, and they might do so as well in terms, in, in relation to acidity as well. So, so there's, it's going to benefit some of them. You know, some phytoplankton might grow faster than others, for instance. Some organisms that don't lay down carbon at Calcium carbonate shells might do better than, you know, become her, more competitive. Her forecast, her forecast was that uh, the winners would be the uh, jellyfish. Yeah, yeah, there's, that, that's been touted quite often, and, and it might be so, but it also might be that, you know, if you take all the fish out of the ocean like we have done, then it leaves a gap. Yeah. So there's lots of things that I don't really think we have, you know, scientists don't have a really good grasp of why jellyfish populations are increasing. Okay, so I thought I'd go on and talk a little bit about the experimental approach that we've tried to take. So I've told you about some of the sort of hazards or the difficulties of understanding what's going to happen to the biology. And, and this is one approach that I think um, sort of covers some of those challenges in a way, and it's um, something that we've been involved in, my group and a couple of other collaborators at the lab, for a, for a number of years now. And we team up with a, a German group from Kiel in Germany to, to do these experiments, and they're what we call mesocosm experiments. And what, what they're aimed at doing is capturing, you know, a big slice, chunk of the ocean, and, and then capturing the planktonic community that's in that. And yeah, all the diversity that's there as well. And then trying to change the acidity in that environment to varying degrees that will replicate what's going to happen over the next 100 years. And then trying to measure and understand what happens to the biology. And so these mesocosms are you can see the middle picture there. They're great big sort of socks, plastic, clear socks. And they're, they're mounted in these frames, these sort of orange frames, and they float out in the ocean. And um, you'll get a better idea of them just in, in, a, in a few minutes. I'll show you some film of it. But um, there's nine, we have nine of them and go various places in the world. This was up in Svalbard in the Arctic. And 
put them out there and then um, let them drift around for a few days and then close them all at the same time so that hopefully they've got all the same sort of planktonic communities in them. And then we add, we pump lots of carbon dioxide into a little bit of water, a little bit of seawater, and we add that to varying degrees to try and mimic what's going to happen in the next 100 years, so the levels of acidity that will happen in the next 100 years. So there's nine, and we have a sort of gradient of acidity going through them. And then we just go out there, lots of small boat work and sampling from these things every day or every other day, depending on how long they, they carry on. But the, this one was for about 30 days, and some of them have gone on for six months. So, um, And we started off in the Arctic because carbon dioxide actually dissolves faster into colder water. So it's more acidic. It's getting more acidic faster in the Arctic and the Antarctic than it is in the tropics. But we also, we, last year, we went to the, the Canaries, which was a really real hardship. And we, <laughs> we didn't enjoy it all. But, um, we did the same sort of experiment there, but actually it was pretty tough. For well, the first time, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, we went out in April, and I, when I, and we got, you know, last that that winter was the stormiest winter in the North Atlantic for for a very long time, and we got hit by a really fierce storm and wiped out, bust all the um, mesocosms, and that was the end of the experiment. Um, so we went back again in September and did it again, and it, it went a bit round the corner into a bit more of a sheltered place, and it worked great. But um, you can see, you, know, you get an idea of what's happening there, and then this sort of spiky thing at the bottom is actually how we add, add the carbon dioxide. So it's, it's a tube, and we pump water down through it, and you lower, lower the tube down through the mesocosms up and down, and add, add that sort of acidic water to, the, to them. Over, over several days, so it's pretty gradual. gradual. And then this is some film that um, my research associate, Kevin Posman, he's just here, he, he took whilst he was there. Um, and it, it's great, it gives you a really, real good flavor of um, how the experiments work. So this is the coast of Gran Canaria. This is flying in on the plane. And, you can see that the bay that we were working at in was, is at the top left-hand corner there. And then the, these are the, those structures getting actually picked up by a ship in this case. And um, so, so it's, it's a really big logistical exercise. And then every day, they're moored about, they were about seven miles away. And so we had to travel out there every morning and sample them. And this is, you can see how much gear is involved. And, cruising across Melanara Bay in the early hours of the morning. Everyone fairly bleary-eyed. Sort of um, yeah, it's, it's great. And you can see a big sort of mountain on Grand Canary, and that, that's how to wake up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's always early, early, early dawn work, really. And lots of small boats just trying to sample from each of the mesocosms, take various measurements and um, yeah it's actually really good fun that, that's a great part of the part of the job and yeah whizzing around in zodiacs <laughs> doing that sort of stuff and, and see the guys with the tube the mesocosms actually have a, a sediment what's called a sediment trap in the bottom and that has a tube that allows you to suck out anything that sort of floated down to the bottom that's quite an important parameter in this case and um, <laughs> And this is really useful footage because it shows you just how deep that is. So it's a really, really good sample of, you know, the, the up, upper mixed layer, we call it, in the ocean, the surface ocean. Really. And um, it's, it's quite difficult to get a, you know, a representative sample from that. So this is Kevin trying to, we had an ingenious sort of hose that you lowered down through the water column. And as it was lowering, it was, there was a vacuum and it pumped water into a, into a, what we call a carboy, just a, a jerry can. And then that's the mother ship that, you know, that all the glass was kept on the aluminium ship, so it wasn't all the glassware. If you had to collect glass bottles or something, they'd get broken. And yeah, you can just see 
it just shows you a bit of the setup. But, but yeah, it's, it's great fun, great conditions most of the time in the Canaries. And, um, what was it like doing this in the Arctic then? Yeah, it was a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> a little bit different. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's still great, you know, great fun. The field work's great fun. And, um, Sorry, yep. Yeah. So this is a big sample that uh, your boat uh, engine exhaust is screwing with your chemistry. Yeah, that's that's a good question, but yeah, hopefully not. And um, not not a lot of gas exchange, I don't think, across that fairly small sort of surface area in the in those tubes. Uh, we hoped, you know. but yeah, always that sort of thing has to be borne in mind. Good good point. And then you know, then the real work begins. You get back home and. Back to the lab, and that's Kirsten, postdoc working on the project, and Kevin doing the analyses, and yeah, keep them busy, and me just keeping out of it as usual. You know? um, and then yeah, so it's a huge logistical thing, and it's that's all done by the Germans, luckily, and they do it much better than I could. <laughs> um, Okay, and we were there to look, look at trace gases, okay, so, um, and how acidification is going to impact trace gases. How am I doing? All right. Run in. Okay. Um, so, what's the, what gas is causing the greatest greenhouse effect? Methane. Methane? No. Any others? One there? Water. Who said water? That's right. It's water. Gold star to that guy. <laughs> water generates about 60% of the greenhouse effect. And um, you're right. Methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide, of course. And then the, the fourth one's ozone. And then nitrous oxide is pretty powerful as well. But lower concentrations and then there's, there are gases obviously that have a bigger greenhouse effect but they're much less lower concentrations. Um, so water warms the earth by having a sort of greenhouse effect. I should say I've put that up that's 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 the Eden project that place is called it's in Ca Cornwall near where I used to live. I live lots of places you see. But, <laughs> but it's a great if you ever go to Southwest Britain, go to the Eden Project. It's, they're all beautiful sort of biomes in there. Really, really, really cool setup. It's very, very well done. It's worth a visit. But anyway, um, I'll get to Yeah, trace gases. Water warms the earth by having that greenhouse effect, but it also cools the earth. So it forms clouds, doesn't it? And they, they're white, and in general, that has a cool, that reflects sunlight off the Earth, and um, helps cool the Earth. So there's that sort of tricky balance there. And I'll go to that first. Clouds form when, quite often, like these ones, when the air full of water vapor rises and then gets cold and it condenses. But it, it can't just condense without something to condense onto. And it condenses onto aerosol particles. And that's, um, that's a really big issue in, in climate sort of prediction because we have a terrible understanding. I mean, lots of people are working really hard on it. It's really really difficult things, but actually we really don't understand how, you know, the sort of microphysics behind aerosol formation and what, how that relates to cloud, con cloud cover and that sort of thing. It's, it's a really hard thing to get a handle on and in all the sort of predictive models that you hear about by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and that sort of thing, that those predictive models, none of them have aerosol, incorporate aerosol effects 
in, in, they have some cloud effects, but they don't have any aerosol effects. And that, that's, a really, that's probably the biggest unknown at the moment in trying to predict climate. And aerosols, some of the aerosols are formed from gases produced by the biology. And that, that's what's happening here. So you're looking at the Blue Ridge Mountains. And it's blue because you're looking through isoprene. Com so the trees give off this compound called isoprene. And it's up there in the atmosphere. And it, that's creating that blue haze. And biology gives off lots of gases. Who's, who's got a beer? Take a sniff. It smells of something. And that, those are quite often, it's quite sulfury. And that, those are trace gases. And actually, a big component of beer, uh, the taste of beer, is a gas called dimethyl sulfide. And that's Paddy Matrai and I have earned our living for 20 years working on that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Took a lot of beer drinking. But dimethyl sulfide is produced by the phytoplankton in the ocean. Uh, the, well, the whole community, actually. Phytoplankton produce a precursor, and then the, the whole microbial community get together and they produce this gas, fluxes into the atmosphere, and generates aerosol particles. And that's what the water forms around and creates. So they, they help create clouds and help cool the Earth, maybe. So what we're interested in is how is ocean acidification going to affect that biology, and how's that going to feed back on aerosol formation and clouds and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I haven't got time to go into this really, but that's um, how the mesocosms progress. But what what we found really was that um, as you increase the acidity, and there's probably we've done about we've done three three or four experiments, and there's been probably nine done altogether now, and I think six of the nine or seven of the nine show the same sort of response. So as you increase acidity in these mesocosms, then you actually generate a decrease in this DMS concentration and a decrease in the emission of DMS to the, potentially to the atmosphere. So if, if you take that, those experiments, you take that result and you put it in a global model, one of these mathematical models that the climate guys use. So we teamed up with some people from the Max Planck Institute of Meteorology in Germany, and they, they plugged this, in, this idea into their model. Then that decrease in emission of DMS actually generates something like a 10% increase in warming. So you're reducing the cloud cover, you're generating more, you're allowing more warming. And it's about equivalent to 10% of the increase warming due to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's actually 10% is that big or small? One thing's for sure, it's very uncertain, you know, but it's, um, it, it just shows you that the biology, just with that one single gas, can actually have quite a big impact on, on, on the globe and feedback, you know, these climate feedbacks are really hard to predict and important. And then one of the other things that's difficult, with, especially with these big mesocosms that are floating around in the ocean, is that you, you can only change the acidity. It's difficult to change any other environmental parameters, but actually it's all happening at the same time, isn't it? You know, it's, the Gulf of Maine is a really good example. It's warming incredibly fast compared with the rest of the global ocean in the Gulf of Maine. And there's, there's acidification going on at the same time. In the Gulf of Maine, the water's freshening, so there's lots, there's actually been more in the last sort of 10, 15 years, there's been more precipitation than there has been for a long time, and that's making the waters fresher as well. So those things are all sort of compounding, and we call it multi-stressor. So now you have to do multi-stressor experiments. You can't get away with just doing one, ex one thing. It's, uh, I was even told that by someone from the NSF, National Sound Science Foundation, the other day. If you, you're, you're out of touch if you're just looking at one environmental parameter, they told me. So that's, that's what we're doing with these things. These are indoor mesocosms. So these big tanks are set up in, at Bigelow here. And we're just, we're actually trying, testing them out for the first time really now. The guys have just come back from sampling them this evening. But they're filled with seawater from the Dam Rascola. Um, we've... There's lighting in there. We can control the temperature. We can 
control the acidity and we're going to try and see what happens with those. But the nice thing about these indoor ones is that you can start to change more than just one parameter. So you can start to try and really mimic what's going to happen as global warming and acidification and freshening and more UV and all that sort of stuff. Who's going to win and who's going to lose? That's it. relative changes are still, you know, this, the general trend is still going to be an acidification you know, alongside the warming. But that, yeah, it's a very good point. And, yep. Hi, I'm Dr. James Hansen, formerly with NASA, the climate scientist. I said on so many occasions that the increase in CO2 will be catastrophic for the Earth and our environment. And what we were saying is that the environment is adaptable. Do you want to clarify your position? Hmm. <laughs> so do I want to clarify my position because I'm saying that biology might adapt to an increasing carbon dioxide concentration. And no, I think the biology will adapt. But um, it, it's going to change. And I, I, something like acidification, I, you know, I, I don't... I, th I think the temperature change is, is a bigger issue, really, and I think that's something that we might not be able to adapt to because there might become a point where things really become catastrophic, and I think that, that's going to be a bigger issue than the, carbon, the acidification. Really. But biology, yeah, there, there'll still be biology around even when that happens. You know, it might not be... Humans. <laughs> but, but, you know, we're, we're going to live with this increase in carbon dioxide, even if we stop tomorrow producing it. You know, it's going to... We're going to live with it for thousands of years. So, for sure. Well, there's one more, and then we'll yep. let everybody go home. Um, I, you know, this problem's going to persist, really, because they increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's get quite a bit of it. About 25% of it's getting taken up by the oceans. And some of that's getting stored in the deep ocean. And that's going to stay there for a 1,000 years or so. But when that water comes back up, then it's going to potentially equilibrate with the atmosphere again and perpetuate the higher higher concentrations. And that's why I say, you know, this, this problem's not going to go away very quickly. It's going to carry on for thousands of years. And that, that's part, partly, right. you're right, it's partly to do with the deep ocean currents and the storage of CO2, the solubility pump, really, storage of carbon dioxide down there. Steve, I'll stay around if anybody has more questions. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thanks, Steve, for his new fashion. <laughs>